Good morning. If you have a copy of God's Word with you, I'd invite you to open it to Acts, the second chapter. That's where we'll be today. Um, But let's pray before we do. Lord God, I thank you for this day. Lord, we come before you thankfully as, as we are people who have received your grace. God, and uh, there's nothing we should be more thankful for than your amazing grace. So Lord, today as we open your word, I pray that you would, you would move in us, that you would move on us, and that we could, we could know you more by seeing how you've worked through your people in the past. God, I pray that you would encourage us, that you would send us out, and that you would let us be a people on mission, on, on your mission, Lord, and, and that we might just see people come to know you and be saved by you. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity and this time together, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I suppose I probably ought to take my own advice and open to the book of Acts. It might be be important if we're going to talk about God's Word. I probably ought to have it open in front of me. Before we get to Acts chapter 2, though, um, I I should probably say thank you all. Thank you to you all um, this last week. For those of you who don't know, we were voted in as your new pastoral family. So I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, we, are, we are excited about what God's doing and where God's leading, and we're, we're excited for this opportunity to be here with you all. But as we do, I have a couple of favors to ask from all of you, okay? Now, please don't worry. I'm not going to do anything too terribly difficult promise. Number one, please be patient. Okay, that's my first request. Please be patient with us. Um, We are learning just as y'all are learning. It's going to take some time and there will be bumps in the road along the way. There will be good times. There will be some difficult times. But as long as we are all patient, we all approach it with grace, we will get through it just fine. Okay, so If you have questions, if you have concerns, I am in the office regularly and I intend to be in the office regularly, please bring them to me. My phone number is always available. You can text me, you can call me, you can email me, you can send me a Facebook message, you can send me a Snapchat. Just get a hold of me, let me know what's going on. I would be happy to talk with you, okay? So please be patient as we do that. Second thing I would like to ask you to do, now this is gonna seem silly, but I am completely serious in this. Every time you talk to me or shake my hand or walk past me, just say your name, okay? Just, just say, even if you think I know you perfectly, like Stephanie, every time you walk past me, just say your name, okay? <laughs> People have given me a hard time. As a matter of fact, Alan asked me this week if I was good with names, and my answer was no, I'm not. So if I don't remember your name, I apologize. We're meeting a lot of new people really fast, and we get people mixed up really bad. So I say we. I get people mixed up really bad. Um, so please, every time, just say your name. I promise at some point we'll be able to stop doing it. But for now, even if you think I know you, just say your name because I may have met you four times and I'll get you confused with somebody. So just tell me your name, all right? So. That's enough of my housekeeping. We can, we can move on. We can get to God's word, the good stuff. Okay, so if you remember where we're at, I just want to tell you where we're at. Okay, we've been looking at the book of Acts. We are finally going to wrap up chapter two, and I've been so excited for this. If you remember both the last two weeks, I was tempted to skip ahead to get to this part. So I am excited for today because we finally got to the good stuff. Not that the other stuff wasn't good, but this is the exciting stuff. Man, I get worked up about this. So We're going to get to that today. But if if we remember where we're at, we saw Jesus in chapter 1 giving his final commands to his his apostles, to to his followers. And then we see him ascend to heaven where he sat down at the right hand of God. So we see him ascend to heaven. And now that these, uh, these people who have been following Jesus have their marching orders, they go back to Jerusalem to wait for the promised Holy Spirit like they were told. And then we saw this awesome sight where the Holy Spirit descends on them with this mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And then they start speaking in tongues and some crazy stuff starts happening here at Pentecost. And then this big crowd of Jewish people starts gathering around them. And last week we talked about Peter preaching. Like Peter stood up amongst this scene and starts preaching to these people. And if you remember the way that I broke this down was we saw the strength of the gospel proclamation was in the Holy Spirit as he came with the power. And then we saw the substance last week of what it was 
that Peter actually preached. He talked about Jesus in the scriptures, like explained the Holy Spirit's here, that's what's going on, and it's all because Jesus is the Son of God. And we saw this whole big scene happen, and Peter preaches, and now we get to see the response to Peter's preaching, and we'll see the result of Peter's preaching. And I know those sound like the same thing, but they are different, and I will explain. But before we do, let's read God's Word together. If you all would stand with me, out of respect for reading God's Word. We will be in Acts, the second chapter, beginning in verse 37. And it says this, When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as, our, as the Lord our God will call. With many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. Did y'all catch that? That day, 3,000 people were saved. Man, that's exciting. And I got excited about this before. Well, whenever I first started thinking about preaching the book of Acts, like I, I started getting excited about this passage. Because it's not like this is a different Holy Spirit that's at work today that was at work in the book of Acts. The same Holy Spirit is alive and well in you and me as believers. The same Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of times we get this thought like this couldn't happen, like 3,000 people can't be saved, but I disagree. I know that the context is different. I know that the circumstances are different, but the same God is at work today as was at work in the book of Acts. God can save people. He can save people. So I think we ought to be looking for that to happen. Before we actually get to the normal points like I always do, we're gonna, uh, th there is something I want to point out real quick. Is, and that's that these people, they were attracted because of the actions, right? They saw, now if you remember back, what they, they heard this wind, they saw the commotion, they heard somebody speaking in their language, and they're thinking, what in the world is going on? So all these people start gathering around. They were attracted by this action. But... It wasn't until after the proclamation of God's word that people start getting saved. Did you notice that? And I think that's really important. I think that that is really, really important. Because I think a lot of times works or the way that we live might pique somebody's interest, but it's not going to change their life. Does that make sense? I hope you're following this because that's what happens here. The actions, like the big scene, uh, it, it piqued their interest. They were curious about it. They said that they were perplexed by it. But it wasn't until Peter actually stands up and proclaims the gospel that people are saved. Okay, now I think this is important. There's a quote that's credited to Francis of Assisi. Um, and most of you have probably heard it. It goes, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Y'all ever heard that before? Yeah, okay. I, I don't like that quote. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like it. I understand what he's getting at. I do not like that quote because what we, what we tend, I say we, what I tend to do is say, well, I'll just, I'll just live it and then I don't tell people and they'll, they'll figure it out, right? No, uh-uh. That is the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Should we live it? Yes, but we should also proclaim it. Like open your mouths and tell people that the reason your life looks different is because of Jesus. 
That's the way that we should be, and that's certainly what we see here in the book of Acts. These people are living empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it gets everybody's attention, but it's not until they open their mouths and they start telling them it's because of Jesus that people are saved. That's important, okay? So live the gospel. Live the way that the Bible teaches we should. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, live in his power, but don't stop speaking. We find in the Bible that the purpose, like the goal of the Holy Spirit is to turn people and point them to Jesus. So if you're not opening your mouth and telling people about Jesus, are you living empowered by the Holy Spirit? We need to be speaking it also. Live it, yes, because you should be living it. We should be living it. If I say that I have Christ in me, my life is going to look different than if it doesn't have Christ in me. But, but we have got to speak because the word of God is what does the saving, not our actions. Okay, let's speak it. All right, there. I couldn't find a nice way to tie a nice little bow on that to where it fit into everything else. So there, I'll say that. Now we'll dive in. Okay, and here, I think we see two specific ways that God's word compels us. It compels us like it just urges us. It pushes us. God's word will challenge us. It will compel us in two specific ways here. And the first of these is that God's word compels us to be responsive. God's word compels us to be responsive. And you can see it here, right? You hear God's word and it naturally, it naturally leads us to the place like, now what do we do? Like, how do we live differently now that we've heard God's word? What needs to change now that we've heard the word of God? And I think here we see four parts to this response. Now, I thought about breaking this into two sermons, and most of y'all are probably thinking I should because the Chiefs play at noon. But we're going to do it in one, all right? We're going to do it in one, and don't worry, I'll move fast. I told them in Sunday school that they better put their seatbelts on because we're going to be cooking today. So, four parts to this response. God's word compels us to be responsive. There are four parts to that response. All right? The first part to that response is remorse. And that sounds strange coming from a Christian pastor. God's word compels us to be remorseful? That's not what you hear. You hear that Christians are supposed to be joyful, that we're always supposed to be happy, we're always supposed to be smiling and feel good. Right? No, God's word compels us to, first of all, be remorseful. You remember last week we dwelt for quite a while on the fact that we are responsible for Jesus' death. We hung on that, and I don't want to forget that. And God's word compels us to this remorse. And you see it play out here in the text. Verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Like they heard God's word being proclaimed. They heard God's word being proclaimed, and it literally says that they were stabbed in the heart. Like the knife was there, it has been twisted, they are feeling the wound. And why is it that they felt that? Why were they pierced to the heart? Because they recognized it, their own guilt. Like they, they saw it, they saw, I'm guilty, I am responsible for this innocent man's death, I am responsible for this, I am guilty. And nobody likes to feel guilt. Like I noticed most of y'all smiles kind of went away at this point and the noise kind of got, it got really quiet pretty quick. We don't like to feel guilty. I certainly don't like to feel guilty. Nobody likes it. But it's kind of a necessary part to receiving the gospel. We see it play out right here. These men were remorseful. They were pierced to the heart. And I would like to tell you that until you have felt the weight of your own depravity, until you have felt the weight of your own guilt, your own shame, until you have felt that, why would you ever turn, why would you ever turn to Jesus? You, you almost have to feel this before you ever would. I mean, it's like, it's like going to the doctor. When do you go to the doctor? When you're feeling great? Like you're skipping along, feeling perfect? No, of course not. You go to the doctor when you're sick. When you know you're sick, when you have the symptoms of being sick, when you feel that, that's when you go to the doctor. And I think Jesus actually alludes to this just a little bit in Mark chapter 2, verse 17. 
He says, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Like Jesus gets this. I'm not coming to fix perfect people. I'm coming to heal the broken people. Like these people who know their own shame. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. A lot of times we have a tendency to get away from our own guilt because, well, we don't like it. But we are. That's what he just talked to him about. Like you and I, our sin is responsible for hanging Jesus on the cross. We killed him. Now, it may have been through somebody else's hands, but we are responsible for Jesus. And the first part to this proper response is Remorse. I believe it was Francis Schaeffer. Now, please don't go and fact check me because I'm not sure it was him. He was asked if he had one hour to convince somebody of the Christian faith, one hour with somebody to convince them that they needed Jesus. He said he would spend the first 55 minutes convincing them of their incredible need and the last five minutes presenting the gospel. 55 minutes convincing them of their need. And why is that? Because until you know that you're broken, that you are guilty, that you are shameful, why would you ever need to be fixed? And honestly, once we recognize how needy we are, the gospels, it makes sense. Like, I'm broken, I need to be fixed, here's a way to fix it. Here is the way to fix it. It it just makes sense. 55 minutes. And I think that's incredibly telling. I think that's that's the way that we have to first respond. The first part to this response is remorse. And until we feel that, we will never turn to Jesus and say, hey, I need fixed. Remorse is the first part to this. And these people got it. These people got it. It says that they were pierced to the heart. And they ask, what should we do? So they're feeling the weight of their own guilt. And they're now saying, how do I get out of this guilt? Like, I know that I'm guilty. What do I do now? It's almost like they're saying, we know we need help. We see this now. How do we get this help? Which leads us to our second part to this response, which is repentance. Repentance. They ask him how they should do, and Peter's first words in verse 38, his very first word is repent. Like, what do we do now? We feel guilty. We feel this remorse. We know that we are at fault. What do we do? And Peter says, repent. He'll go on and we'll get there in just a minute. But the first part here is repentance. And this is an important concept for multiple reasons. Um, One, it's an imperative. And for those of you who aren't grammar nerds, an imperative is a command. Like, it's not optional. He's saying, do this. And there's an applied you in front of it. So not only is he saying, do this, he's saying, you repent. It kind of gets personal pretty quick. The first thing you do is you repent. And I know that a lot has been made about this word repent. I know that in Christian circles, especially you come to a worship service, I'm sure that if you've spent any time in church services, you've heard somebody talk about the word repent and how it literally means to turn I'm sure you've heard that. As a matter of fact, I think I may have said that. I don't know. But it's an important one, and we have to get this. Like, this isn't optional. This is something we need to understand. We need to get it. It comes from the Greek word metanoia. And I'd pronounce the verbal form, but I can't. Um, So it comes from the word metanoia, which literally means to think differently afterwards, to reconsider, or to change the inner man. It is talking about this fundamental internal shift. That's what he's telling them. He's telling them, change the inner man. (laughs) A lot of times we get this idea like we just need we just need some small change and it'll be it'll be fine, but that's not what he's telling them. Brothers, what should we do? Change yourself at the very core of who you are. That's what they're commanded to do. You need, I like to say you need a heart transplant. That's what you need. You need a heart transplant. You are terminal apart from it. And I I think the best description of this, and it's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, comes from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, 26. Some of you may know it by heart. 
It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what we need. That's what this repentance is. That's what this is. It's, it's the shift where God takes our stone heart, this cold, lifeless heart, and he gives us a heart of flesh. He gives us his heart. He changes the very core of who we are. We see this fundamental shift in the inner being, this, this change. And that has glaring implications, doesn't it? Like glaring implications. If you have that fundamental shift inside you towards Christ, away from whatever it was that you were doing before, doesn't that necessarily mean that your actions are going to be different also? Like how could you continue to live the same way if you say that the very heart that you have is different? It doesn't make sense. If you have, if you have God taking your heart out, giving you his heart, how in the world could you continue to follow yourself? You're going to follow him. You're going to follow him. This turning away from ourselves, this, this repentance, will always see us turning away from ourselves and following after Christ, which actually ties us perfectly into the, the third part of this response. The third part of this response, which is reception. So we had, <laughs> we had remorse, we had repentance, and now we've got reception. All right, This reception, and it plays out in two ways. All right, now that they've turned, we've turned from ourselves. We're following Jesus. We're following after him. The first way that this reception plays out is right here in the text. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the reception. The first way that plays out is through baptism. We receive baptism. One of the things I was attracted to this congregation for is because we, we believe in believer's baptism. We believe that once you've received God's grace, once you have had that heart transplant that we just talked about, the natural response to that is baptism. That's the natural response. If you have now turned from yourself and you're following after Jesus, you're going to do it for a couple of reasons. You're going to want to be baptized for multiple reasons. One, because Jesus demonstrated it. And two, because Jesus assumes that you will do it. He assumes that you will. Ha, funny. I actually thought that was interesting. Of course, we know Jesus, one of his first public acts, whenever he, the sign of his public ministry beginning was his baptism. In, in the book of Luke, you see Jesus go and he's baptized immediately. He's taken out to the wilderness and he's tempted. And then we see his public ministry take off. That's what happens in the book of Luke. So not only will we do like Jesus did, not only will we do like he did, we will also do as he assumes we do. And I found this interesting. There is no place in the New Testament where Jesus expressly says, you go be baptized. It's not there. I thought it was. I was wrong. It's not there. Instead, what we see is Jesus assumes that because you're following him, you will be baptized. It's just an assumption. Like, why would you not? If you are following Jesus, you should follow him in believer's baptism, and he assumes that you will. Probably the perfect example of this is the Great Commission. The Great Commission, we all know pretty well. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Okay? So the assumption is, as you make disciples, those disciples will be baptized. That's the assumption. And there are other examples like that. We receive Christ, and part of that reception is the identification with him through baptism. And that's what these people are commanded to do. They feel this remorse. They say, what do we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Receive baptism. And the second way that we receive this gospel message, the second part to this reception response, is the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter gets to the point here at the end after he talks about baptism. If I can find my place again. 
He says, Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First of all, notice that it's not conditional. He says you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not like you might receive it. It's kind of wishy you No, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's very clear. But it almost seems, it almost seems as if he's making this conditional on baptism, doesn't it? It almost seems that way, doesn't it? I don't believe that's the case, though. Because we see other places, we see other places in the Bible where it makes it abundantly clear that you receive the Holy Spirit through faith. Abundantly clear. Galatians 3.14 says, we receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. It is as straightforward as it gets. Okay, so how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile this? I would like to tell you that the Holy Spirit comes to you not as a direct result of repentance or baptism, but as an indirect result. Let me explain, okay? You are not saved by any action. You do not receive the Holy Spirit because of any action you have done, can do, or will do. You don't. That's not the case. Instead, what you see here is the natural response to following Jesus is these actions. Those are a natural outpouring of the faith with which you receive the Holy Spirit. Are are you following this logic? Are you following this at all? Okay. If you have received the Holy Spirit through faith, if you have received Christ and his salvation through faith, if you have, then naturally you will repent and naturally you will be baptized. They go along with it. They are, they are two things. It is an outward expression of the inward reality that we have been saved in the same way as we will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you receive the Holy Spirit just like you are saved by grace through faith, no conditions necessary. Which all actually ties me to my fourth response, which is replication. Okay, remorse, repentance, reception, and replication. I'm not that smart. The R's just kept coming up for some reason. Replication. And we see it, 39 through 41. It says, for the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, as many as our Lord as I cannot read that passage. As many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted this message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. We see replication taking place right here. He basically says, this promise that I'm, I'm giving you, like this promise that you are hearing from God, is not just for you. It is certainly for you, but it's bigger than just you. It's for your children, and for your children's children, and for your children's children's children. And you get the point. It goes on and on and on. And boy, that's good news. I love my kids. My kids are awesome. This promise is for them. It's for your kids, for your grandkids. It is for all people. This promise of salvation by grace through faith is for all. All of them, as many as our Lord will call. Boy, that's awesome. Like, as weighty as we were last week on on crucifying Jesus, like, you were the reason Jesus died. I want to be even weightier here because God's grace is enough. (laughs) If God calls somebody to them, it's not like there's a question mark. Is his grace going to be good enough? No, it's good enough. He says, they will be saved. Just let that sink in for a minute. Like, you don't have to worry. Like, is God's grace going to be good enough for me? Of course it's going to be good enough for you. He took the weight of your shame, that guilt, that remorse that we talked about earlier. He says, I'm going to die so that you don't have to feel that. I'm going to remove your shame. I'm going to remove your guilt. I'm going to take your place. And my grace is enough. Ooh, that's good news. Not just some good news, that's the good news. If God calls someone to himself, when God calls someone to himself, his grace is all that's needed. 
It is enough. It is sufficient. It is the reason we're here gathered around God's word because his grace was sufficient for, for even lowly, dirty sinners like me and like you. And some of you are thinking, boy, you just called me a dirty, lowly sinner. <laughs> yes, I did. And I meant it. <laughs> but God's grace is enough. But then the text goes on and it says that Peter testifies or he warns and then he strongly urges or implores these people to be saved. Like it says, he strongly urges this kind of a response. Like he is urging people to receive God's grace. These are people who are gathered around because they just saw this amazing scene, right? The Holy Spirit descending on these people and now they're doing miraculous things. And they're all gathered around and he's like, you know what, receive the promised Holy Spirit. And now he is urging people to do it, to take that step. And I started thinking like, have I ever strongly urged someone to receive God's grace? I always get this question, like, how many times, like, how, how aggressive do I need to be with taking the gospel to somebody? I always get that question because people are like, what? and they, they mean well. They do. The question is, like, I don't want to drive people away by continually throwing this at them and throwing it at them. And I'm like, he is strongly urging people. Like, he is pleading with them to be saved. He's telling them and urging, and it says with many other words. Like, he's not just saying this one word, and then he's done. Like, okay, if they want to receive that, they will. No, he continues to strongly urge people. He is pleading with them to be saved. And this generation is no less corrupt, no less harsh, no less crooked. This generation, is, it may look different, but it's the same concept that we see here in the book of Acts. People are still destined for hell apart from the grace of God. They are. And Peter gets it, and he is urging people to be saved. I started thinking, have I ever urged someone to receive God's grace? Like pleading with them, warning them, testifying to them, just urging them to be saved. And, you know, I started thinking about this in the context of the church. Maybe, maybe week one is not a good time to start doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's probably a lack of wisdom. Y'all should have thought about that. Um, man, I, I hope you know I'm joking. Please. Whew. I want Christian Fellowship Church in Mount City. This is what I want. I want Christian Fellowship Church in Mount City to be the kind of church that people have to fight against to go to hell. Well, let me say that a different way. If there's somebody that is headed towards hell, I want Christian Fellowship Church right here in Mount City. I want us as a body to be grabbing their legs, tripping them up, doing everything we can to stop them on their road to hell and try to turn them so that they go the other direction. I mean, I just want us to, to f make people trip and fall over us every chance we can going that way and just run with them the other way. Like, I hope that's what you want. Because a lot of times our lives don't suggest that. A lot of times it suggests like, well, I'm going to put this little block in front of you, and if you step over it, then I, I tried. You know, I step away. No, that's not what I want. I want there to be walls built between people and hell. I want everything we can between people and hell to be put in the road. I want to urge people to receive this gospel and be saved. Do y'all want that? Man, that's what I want. I want to be a part of a church that people have to go kicking and screaming to hell and I just want us to be pulling them every way we can. I want to urge people to be saved. And here, it doesn't say that all the people accepted that message. It doesn't say that all the people received God's grace that day. It's not what it says. It says that 3,000 people did. It doesn't say that all the people who heard it did. Thank God for those 3,000. And I'm not saying that 3,000 people are going to be saved today. That's not for me to decide. Do I believe that thousands of people could come to faith in Jesus today? I do. I do. I absolutely believe that. Because I believe that God is moving. That means that we need to start urging people to be saved. 
and trust that many will be saved. Many will be saved. As many as there are that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the first thing that we see in God's word is God's word compels us to be responsive. Okay? Second part, God's word compels us to be devoted. And I told you we would move fast. I promise we'll go really fast through this. And you all just saw four more points pop up there, and you're thinking, oh, dude, come on. We'll move fast, I promise. Okay. The natural result of all these people, 3,000 people being saved. 3,000 people were saved. There were roughly 120. We saw earlier on about 120 people were gathering together. 3,000 people are saved here at Pentecost. So now we have 3,120. All these people are out there. They are doing this thing. They are replicating. They are, they are being responsive. But next, God's word compels us to be devoted. And the natural result of these people being saved was the church. That was the natural result of people being saved. People are now gathering together because they realized how desperate they really were to be saved. They received God's grace. They have received the Holy Spirit. And now they're gathering together. And we see this formation of the first church. And I'm going to give you a quick summary of what these four points are going to be. So don't cheat and go ahead. But it's right there in verse 42. I tried not to get too cute with it. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were devoted to these things. And we read that and we're like, okay, these people were devoted to it because it's a past tense word, right? It was done. They were devoted. No, no, no. The word is actually active. It's actually happening. It's present tense. Right now, this is happening. They were actively devoting themselves to these things. It's not like, okay, we've received the grace, now we're perfect, and we can just go. Now, they were perfect as far as if they died that day, they would be with their Savior. They were saved. But it's not as if everything like that, all of a sudden, they were perfectly devoted in each one of these four areas. No, they actively worked towards perfect devotion. They were constantly devoting themselves. They, they saw how important being devoted to these things were, and they moved in that direction. Not a group of perfect people, but broken people who wanted to see the gospel lived out because they wanted and yearned for better devotion. They knew what they'd received, and they devoted themselves to these things. So what exactly were they devoted to? We saw the apostles' teaching first. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. We see each one of these things kind of, in a way, play out from here on. Verse 43 says, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. These people were naturally devoted to the apostles because they saw the power that came along with being an apostle of Christ. They were devoted to their teaching. It says the people were filled with awe or wonder or fear, and these signs were being done, and of course people were listening to them. But the question then naturally comes in my mind, can we be equally as devoted, not having seen the apostles live here today performing these signs and miracles, can we still be devoted to the apostles' teaching? And I'm going to give you a very simple answer. The answer is yes. The answer is yes, of course we can be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Of course we can. Most of our New Testament is originally written by the apostles. You see Paul in most of his letters, he introduces himself as an apostle of Christ. You have John writing letters. You have Peter writing letters. Our New Testament is largely teaching directly from the apostles, which I find a little bit ironic because we're studying the book of Acts here, which was not written by one of the original apostles. <laughs> However, what Luke is doing is he's going and he is interviewing. He's talking with the apostles of Christ. He is looking at their teaching. He is recording their teaching. And that's what we're seeing right here. We are learning from the apostles. We are devoting ourselves to their teachers. Even by being here to hear God's word, we are devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching. We need to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Second thing we see is the fellowship. They were devoted to the fellowship. And I put that up there intentionally with the fellowship, not just fellowship. In the Greek, the definite article is attached. The the is there. And that changes things slightly. Slightly. Fellowship, like getting together and having fellowship, is certainly included in that. But, but, what this literally says is that they were devoted to the church. As we know the church. Not a building, but the people. 
They were devoted to this fellowship, to this gathering. The word is the koinonia word that we all hear about, like the gathering, the fellowship, the people that gathered together in Jesus' name. These people devoted themselves to that. And it plays out in verses 44 through 45, really through the end, but for the sake of my outline, we're going to say 44 and 45. It says, now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. We see them devoting themselves to the church, to the fellowship right here. And it plays out. Even this one part plays out in two parts. First of all, they were together. They had fellowship. It says that they were constantly gathered together. Like these people were so devoted to the church that they wanted to be with the church. Ha, that's a crazy concept. I got time. I have an older brother. Okay, I'm going to tell a story on my oldest brother because he's not here and I can do that. My oldest brother, he, he works for the railroad. They weld tracks together. So there's these big heavy welders they set down on these tracks and, and they weld together. Well, one day he, I don't know how, did something silly. I'm not going to say the other word I want to say. And this welder was set on the end of his middle finger, on the end of it, and it pinched the end of his finger off. Pinched it off. It's terrible. It had to have hurt terribly. I, I call him 9.7 now because he's got nine fingers plus 0.7. So, my brother. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he's bigger than me, but I'm, I'm good. Um, so, so, I like to think of this. like That piece of his finger that is not there is that a part of his body? I would say no. It's no longer a part of his body. It's dead, decaying someplace else. It's not a part of his body. It may be a body part, but it is not part of his body. If you were to come up here right now, please don't, and you were to cut my arm off, my arm would still be a body part, but it would not be a part of my body. It would not be connected. In the same way, people are like, well, yeah, I'm a part of that church. Well, are you? I'm not trying to be critical of anybody. Please, don't hear that. But if you are not directly connected to that church, you may be a body part, but are you a part of that body? These people were devoted to the fellowship. Like, they were constantly moving towards perfect devotion and being a perfect part of the body, connected to it. They were together constantly. You see it all throughout the book of Acts where these people are gathered together, not just on Sunday mornings, but all week long, you see that they were daily gathered in the temple. They were daily gathered from people's houses, and that's what you see. People were together. They cared for one another, which is the second part that we see. Not only were they together, they cared for one another. They were devoting themselves to the fellowship by caring for one another. And here you see them sell property and distribute the proceeds as anybody has need. And what this is not is an early call for communism. Instead, what this is is just showing how much people cared for one another. They cared for people enough that they're like, I'm going to set my benefits aside and I'm going to help you. They were devoted to helping one another. They loved one another. And we got to move on. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. As a part of this fellowship, they were devoted to breaking bread together. We see it play out in verse 46. It says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. Literally, they took the Lord's Supper together. They did. They proclaimed Christ's death by taking the Lord's Supper together. They celebrated together. They declared his resurrection together. They shared life together. These people were committed and devoted to doing this together, to breaking bread together, to declaring Christ together. And then finally, we see that they were devoted to prayer. Verse 47 says, as they ate their food, sorry, back up to verse 46, second half says, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were praising God. They saw how incredibly blessed they were and they let it boil out of them, probably in some form of praise, which is a type of prayer. These people were devoted to it. They were thanking God constantly. They were there. And we should also devote ourselves to prayer as we meet together individually and as we recognize God's goodness and let it boil over in our lives through praise. We should be devoted to prayer. And as a result of the church being the church and trusting God to move, the end of verse 47 happens. 
It says, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Every day. Whew. So a lot of people, myself included at times, get hung up on church growth, like individual church growth. We get hung up on that, like, do numbers grow? Well, I remember reading Charles Spurgeon who said, numbers shouldn't be our primary focus. However, they should be something that we look at because it's very telling of, are we proclaiming the gospel? So, these people saw the church grow every single day. Why? Because they were devoted and they trusted God to move. They prayed. They declared Christ. They devoted themselves to the Word and to the church. And then they trusted the Holy Spirit to work. We need to do likewise. God's Word compels us to be responsive. It compels us to be devoted. So what? So what do we do now? If you're here, if you're here, and you are a believer, if you do believe that Christ died for your sins, if you have received His grace... Be a devoted believer. The Bible talks about lukewarm Christians and how they're spit out. Don't be lukewarm. The Christian faith is not something that's, that's in between, like it's a middle ground. No, no, the Christian faith is actually one of the most radical faiths in the world. No, 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 not one of. It is the most radical faith in the world. Radical is a word that kind of gets a bad rap because we hear about radical Islam. We hear about that. Man, we need to be radical Christians. Radical Christians completely and totally sold out for Jesus in every single way. There are plenty of people who would be happy to be middle of the road, but that's not what Jesus compels us to. He compels us to devotion, to being perfectly devoted. So what does that look like? I'm not saying that you have to be perfect today. Instead, I would like to see you move the right direction. Move the right way. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. What's the next step for you? In your Christian faith, what is your next step? Okay, Maybe for some of you, you realize you're not devoted to the apostles' teaching. Maybe the next step for you is being devoted to that. Daily Bible study, daily Bible reading in some way, shape, or form. Being devoted to that. Maybe that's your next step. Perhaps some of you haven't been devoted to prayer. Maybe you say, I need to have a quiet time. Maybe that's you. I need to be devoted to prayer. Take that next step. Perhaps it's a small group huh, gathering together for Sunday school or a midweek study or just maybe it's, maybe it's personal discipleship. You're saying, you know what? I have never had somebody take me aside and personally pour into my life, intentionally pour into my life, memorize scripture with me, pray with me, study the Bible with me, just be there with me. Maybe you've never had that. If you haven't, then maybe the next step for you is to find somebody who will. And I know that there are men and women all around this room who would do that. I know that even though I've never asked any of them. I know that they are here. Find somebody. If you have never had that, find somebody. Maybe that's the next step for you. It's personal discipleship. Whatever the next step is, if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, take that next step. And if you are not a believer... If you are not a believer, God's word compels us just like it did these people 2,000 years ago to respond. Maybe you have never heard the gospel presented. Maybe you have never heard it presented this way where you realize that you are guilty of Christ's death. Like you are responsible for that. Maybe you were here last week and you heard that and you said, I don't exactly know what to do with that. Well, Today, here in just a few moments, I'm going to offer an invitation. We're going to sing, and I would invite you to come. I would like, I would like, no, I would love it if you came and you said, I want to repent, I want to be baptized, like I want to receive Jesus in that way. Uh, I promise you that God isn't just making you feel guilty for the sake of guilt. That's not the purpose. As a matter of fact, he will remove your guilt. He will remove your shame. If you trust him with it, just give it to him. So, 
If that's you today, I would invite you here in just a moment. Maybe you've never followed Jesus. Maybe you've never followed him in baptism. I would love to talk with you and pray with you. If you have never received God's grace, I would, boy, I would love to talk with you and pray with you and see you added to the number today, just as we saw it here. So we're going to pray together, and then we're going to sing, and I invite you to come. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the excitement that we could see as thousands of people came to know you as their, as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that work. God, I believe that you are still in the business of saving people, that you are still in the business of calling people to yourself, Lord, and I pray that we could see that take place here today and as we move forward together as your body, Lord. I pray that we would see people saved. God, help us to be devoted to your, to your apostles' teachings, to prayer. God, help us to be devoted to the church. Lord, I pray that you would make us devoted Christians, people who, who want to see you more than we want to see anything else, just devote ourselves to you. And Lord, for those people who, who can hear this right now, for those people who are here, God, I pray, I pray that if they don't know you, that you would soften their hearts and that they might receive your grace. Lord, I pray that you would call many to yourself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.